Light and peace in Jesus Christ our Lord. God. It is not ourselves that we proclaim. We proclaim Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. For the same God who said, out of darkness let light shine, has caused his light to shine within us, to give the light of revelation, the revelation of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth, in all truth, with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Amen. A reading from the letter to the Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life, so then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. 
In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances so that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As our Savior Jesus Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite your own intercessions and thanksgivings, either silently or aloud. pray for this gathering, that it might draw us closer to you and to each other. God of unity and peace, in baptism you have made us one people in the body of your Son. Hear us as with one voice we offer you these prayers in the name of Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. I invite you all to join in the singing of this hymn.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. My name is Robert Heaney, uh, and I have the honor of being the director of Virginia Theological Seminary's Center for Anglican Communion Studies, and have the distinct joy of working with a marvelous team, both within the department and within the institution that can pull off events like this evening. We're particularly excited to welcome you not only to this Mollagen Forum, but to the official launch of our 20th anniversary year. We are delighted too that we are partnering with the Seminary Center for Liturgy and Music this evening. Before Dean Markham formally welcomes our keynote speaker and opens our 2017 Mollagen Forum, let me take a moment to say something about uh, the vision of our center. Uh, we talk about existing to promote and practice better community for the communion. And this we do through three imperatives, uh, reflect, uh, resource, reconcile. We create space and seek to create space for Episcopalians and their neighbors to reflect theologically, to reflect both amidst affection and disaffection. We produce resources to equip Anglicans for the mission of God, and that often means consultations, research, and publications. Indeed, right now we are working uh, on two publications, one on theologies of reconciliation and one on mission partnerships across theological differences. We work for best practices in reconciliation as well as current work on a publication in this field. We're also involved in partnerships and grant-funded work on peace building in sites of conflict here in North America, but also in West Africa and the Middle East. And all of that is interesting and intriguing and sometimes inspiring. But I think uh, what my team and I agree on is that the best bit of it all is the people we get to meet and the relationships that emerge. The best bit of it all is witnessing to the spirit of Christ weaving bonds of affection through this work we do as Virginia Seminary's Center for Anglican Communion Studies. Congratulations on the 20th anniversary of the Center for Anglican Communion Studies at Virginia Theological Seminary. For 20 years now, you have helped us in the Anglican Communion to grow more fully as a communion that follows the way of Jesus as a community that spans the world. The Anglican Communion is representative of the family of God, a family that crosses all national boundaries, a family that crosses racial boundaries, a family that brings together people of all stripes and types who would follow the way of Jesus. We are blessed to be part of that Anglican family, and we are blessed to be witnesses of God in this world that one day all people, all races, and all nations will truly live as the human family of God. So happy birthday to the center, and may your work continue for many, many years to come. I would like to congratulate CACS on celebrating your 20th anniversary. I am grateful for the communion because our diversity reflects the beauty of God. I just want to uh, send my greetings and say congratulations uh, to the center 
on its very important milestone, 20 years of painful witness and service, uh, not only uh, to uh, the population in America, but the whole Anglican community. Um, I would like to wish uh, the Center of Anglican Community Studies um, the wonderful 20th anniversary celebrations. Um, thank you to Dr. Robert Henney and the staff and all your team members for working hard in this space of Communion and Communion Studies. Congratulations to the VTS Centre for Anglican Communion Studies that you've reached 20 years. In English terms, you're one year short of being adults and getting the key. Now, I suspect you've all had that for a while. You have done brilliantly. It's wonderful that you exist. What's the Anglican Communion mean for me? For me, the Anglican Communion is a bewildering, extraordinary, miraculous, diverse, remarkable range of cultures, of languages, of attitudes, of people, living in wealth and immense poverty, in security and immense suffering all round the world, brought together by God the Father to proclaim the love of Jesus Christ through the grace of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the greatest miracles of the church. I mean, that's pretty impressive. I mean, um, and it really is a remarkable birthday we're celebrating. Um, and uh, I'm here to, well, first of all, I'm Ian Markham. I'm the Dean and President of Virginia Theological Seminary. Um, and I'm here to share with the body gathered that at uh, the board meeting today, the following resolution was adopted by Virginia Theological Seminary's Board of Trustees. Therefore, be it resolved that the Virginia Theological Seminary Board of Trustees recognizes the achievement of the Center for Anglican Communion Studies in serving for 20 years. We recognize the hard work of Peter James Lee, Richard Reed, Martha Horne, Mitzi Buddy, Barney Hawkins, and Robert Heaney, as well as the loyal staff. So let's just recognize this remarkable moment. <laughs> So this is a Mollogen uh, forum for 2017. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Albert T. Mollogen taught New Testament and Ethics at Virginia Theological Seminary from 1936 until 1974. He had an enormous impact on countless generations of students as a powerful and charismatic teacher who was deeply committed to the ongoing conversation between church and the wider society. Key to his methodology was the challenge of fostering dialogue between theology and the structures of power that inspired many generations of students to become more deeply engaged with broad range of social issues. Along with our panelists tonight, which Dr. Heaney will introduce, I want to acknowledge the presence this evening of sister seminarians who are taking part in a Reconciling Practices project launched by the Center for Anglican Communion Studies. If you may stand when I announce your institution, we understand we have seminarians from Duke Divinity School. Please stand, thank you, sir. From the Shoda House, please stand, thank you. From Trinity School of Ministry, thank you. And Yale Divinity School. And let's please give them a warm welcome. <laughs> My task is to introduce uh, Archbishop Josiah Atkins Idowu Firon, who's from northern Nigeria. Uh, his intention when young was to pursue a career in the armed forces, but God had different plans for him. And uh, God called Josiah to faith. He, he told this story extremely movingly yesterday about the discovery and the encounter with Christ 
in a culture dominated by Islam and uh, invited him into a place where the ministry that was to shape uh, his obligations to the church was to be a reconciler and peacemaker. Uh, ultimately, he became a priest and then a bishop and, of course, is now an archbishop. Uh, the Most Reverend Dr. Josiah Idowu Fearon holds doctorates in sociology and theology. Uh, he has a, a master's from Hartford Seminary, where I served as academic dean, and he has degrees from the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom and from the University of Durham. He has wide-ranging experience throughout the world as a professor, preacher, and peace builder. Given his expertise in interreligious affairs, he is in demand internationally, and he holds or has held leading roles in the Program for Christian Muslim Relations in Africa, the Interreligious Council, World Council of Churches, the World Economic Forum, the Network for Interfaith Concerns in the Anglican Communion, and the Tony Blair Foundation. He's been honored by the Nigerian government. He's an officer of the Order of the Niger, and in the Anglican Communion, he is a recipient of the St. Augustine's Award. And in 2015, when others would have been thinking of retiring, our Archbishop was appointed Secretary General of the Anglican Communion. We, as Episcopalians, are, of course, full members of this communion, which is a family of 39 autonomous churches in over 165 countries with a membership of 85 million sisters and brothers. And as Secretary General, he serves the communion's four instruments of uh, unity uh, and is responsible for touring the world, building bridges between the different natures, nations and cultures that make up the communion. In a recent interview, Archbishop Josiah was reflecting on the challenges of service in the communion, but found himself saying, the fact that we're, we are a communion is a miracle. And he confesses that even though with all the demands of the communion, three words comes to his lips as he thinks about it, and those three words are, I love the communion. I really do think this program tonight is vitally important. We should all learn to love this remarkable gift to the world and to the church. And it's important because the temptation of every tradition is to become local and provincial. We are an attempt at a truly global family. It's an attempt to live with difference and diversity and at the same time seek to realize the prayer of our Lord that we might all be one. So distinguished guests, panelists, sisters and brothers, you're welcome to Virginia Theological Seminary and the 2017 Mollagen Forum. Please join me as we welcome our illustrious keynote speaker, the Most Reverend Dr. Josiah Idowu Firon. Thank you very much. Thank you. In my <clears throat> part of the world, uh, when you are invited to speak and you are the first speaker or second speaker, in order to save time, we say all protocols observed. <laughs> but uh, I'm not in Nigeria. <laughs> I want to begin by honestly thanking Dean Markham for accepting that I be invited to participate at your 20th, 20th anniversary celebration. Uh, he's been very, very kind to me and very hospitable, and I think I'll try and come back. <laughs> and um, I also want to ta thank uh, Dr. Dr. Heaney for actually inviting me, because if he hadn't invited me, the dean will not have accepted. <laughs> so Robert, Robert and I, we work together uh, on the Lambeth Design Group. That's how we 
uh, got to know each other and we are still getting to know each other. And your lovely team, uh, everybody at the department. And I also want to thank all the seminarians who've uh, uh, given their time to make me feel very much at home here. I thought I was running away from the cold winter in London, <laughs> uh, but Monday was really cold here. But the seminarians were really very friendly, so I want to thank all of you. And I think tonight I want to recognize my boss, uh, the first Secretary General, Sam Van Kulin. Please stand, I know you're an old man, please. <laughs> uh, the, the, the foundation he laid, the structure he put in place, uh, keep the communion going today. Sam, thank you very much for your hard work. And I also want to recognize one of my uh, friends from Nigeria, uh, Professor John Campbell. Please stand and let us see you. John, there he is. <clears throat> John was um, the American ambassador to Nigeria when I was uh, uh, archbishop there and being an Episcopalian, we really got on very well together and he made sure my visas were issued on good time. <laughs> I want to begin by addressing our brothers and sisters, the seminarians. But I think I left out one important group here, the members of the Board of Trustees of this institution. I want to be invited back. So, <laughs> so uh, thank you for being here and thank you for all you do in order to see that this institution keeps her focus on the uh, agreement when the institution was set up. I pray that uh, the Lord will continue to bless each and every one of you and uh, you will not be tired as you continue to serve the Lord. So I begin by saying, dear seminarians, you will soon begin a great adventure that I myself began over 40 years ago. You are now training for ministry in the Church of Jesus Christ, and more specifically, in the Anglican ex expression of the Christian faith. And on some days, you may have some doubts or fears about that your vocation. If you spend a lot of time reading Anglican blogs, you might get the impression that all we ever do as Anglicans is argue about sex <laughs> and demonize those who disagree with us. And in the face of all the reports, real enough as far as they go, regarding the rapid decline of Christian faith in the West among young people and adults both, you might well be tempted to despair over the integrity of our witness. But I'm here today to tell you that the negative narrative of the bloggers is a distortion of the truth. I'm here to tell you that the Anglican communion is alive and well. I'm here today to tell you that, as St. Paul says, the gospel of Jesus Christ is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world. And one major and vital instrument for the gospel growing and bearing fruit is the Anglican family of churches. Like all families, we have our problems and disagreements. But like all families, we have a great strength working together. And I'm here tonight to tell you about the vitality or strength today of the communion. And I want to begin by 
saying a few things on evangelism and church planting within the Anglican communion. Jesus commanded us to make disciples of all nations by baptizing and teaching. And he promised to be with us always to the end of time. The Great Commission is our primary and fundamental job as the Church of Jesus Christ. And the Anglican churches are at the forefront of evangelism and church planting all over the world. The Anglican Communion's membership has grown over 10% in the last decade, and this is not due only to the birth rate. Much of it, in the face of other pressures, is the result of simple, persistent, and faithful sharing of the gospel. Perhaps we know about this in areas like Africa and Asia. But there is even some soaring testimony in places like England. Most of what you read about the church attendance in the Church of England is not encouraging. But remember that English Anglicans were the pioneers in Protestant world mission in the 18th and 19th centuries, and the fruit of their sacrificial labors laid the foundations for our burgeoning communion today. And that spirit is still alive. There are many shining lights in the midst of a challenging religious landscape. The Diocese of London is one of those lights, and I want to zero in on that diocese for a few minutes. Holy Trinity Brompton, most people call HTB, has had a profound impact on church attendance and church planting in the Diocese of London. HTB is the most highly attended parish in the Church of England, with an average weekend attendance of over 6,000 worshippers. Because of its great success in making disciples of Jesus and the limitations of its building size, it has planted many new congregations in the vacant church buildings in and around London. It has also helped many other parishes to grow. The main instrument for HTB's growth, of course, most of you know, is the Alpha course, which is now being used by thousands of churches of many different denominations in 169 countries all over the world. More than 16 million people have attended an Alpha course. And of those, many have dedicated their lives to Jesus Christ, including our own Archbishop, Justin Welby, who became a Christian in East Africa, but rededicated his life to the service of the Lord through Alpha course. Alpha is also being widely used in the prisons a military basis in England. HTB's example and influence have helped to change the culture of the Diocese of London over the past 25 years. With the leadership of Bishop Charters, who has just recently retired, the Diocese established in 2015 the Center for Church Planting and Church Growth with the goal of planting 100 new congregations in the diocese. A new suffragan bishop was consecrated with the sole responsibility of overseeing this effort. And since 2015, 27 new congregations have been started with an average weekly attendance of 1,240 worshippers. Evangelism and church planting are alive and well and growing in London. 
other Western Anglican churches need to be encouraged and inspired by this and also learn from it. As I said, though there is amazing witness going on around the Anglican world more broadly, consider the Diocese of Singapore alone. This single diocese has five missionary deaneries. These deaneries are the following countries, Indonesia, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Nepal. In each of these deaneries, new people are becoming disciples of Jesus. Churches are being formed, and the groundwork is being laid to form new dioceses. In 2016, Bishop Rennes, the Bishop of Singapore, flew by helicopter into remote villages in the Himalayas to baptize and confirm over 500 new Christian disciples, all brought to Christ through Anglican missionaries. Who supports this tremendous work? The people of the Anglican Church in Singapore, assisted by friends from elsewhere in the world. Now, Asian Anglicans are taking the lead in supporting the work of evangelization in the area of the greatest Christian growth in the world, China. We should, be pray, we should be paying attention, brothers and sisters. You are, however, probably more familiar with the tremendous growth of the Anglican churches in Africa. In most parts of that continent, church planting missions are a priority. In a particular diocese I know about, every priest from the dean of the cathedral to the most newly ordained deacon is expected to participate in a two week long missions which involve basic evangelism every year. These missions are costly in terms of the limited amounts of money and energy we have. There is no economic benefit to planting churches in these remote rural areas. In fact, the new converts are poor and have no money to give to the diocese. What's the motivation? The motivation is that everybody should know and experience the joy and freedom and hope of knowing Jesus Christ as their personal savior. That's the motivation. Now, in the West, we hear many sincere and worthy pleas that the church be more inclusive. In my country, Nigeria, within the Anglican church, we try to demonstrate that inclusive impulse by reaching out to the rural poor. And it has produced great spiritual benefits. And some of our able church leaders have come from these rural evangelism efforts, including some of our bishops. Let's move on to interface with extremist Islam. Evangelism is at the center of Christian witness, but part of its character and much of its fruit lies in the way that the gospel engages and finally transforms cultures in the midst of social change and challenge. Anglican evangelism has always witnessed to this transforming power that comes in the life of Christ and his spirit. Take the reality of militant Islam. On September the 11th, in 2001, most people in the Western world, for the first time, became aware of what Anglicans in the developing world have lived with 
for our entire life. And with each passing year since then, it has become more clear that we Christians need to find creative ways to live with our Muslim neighbors. Neither faith is going away. And we need to learn to live together with respect and mutual forbearance. Whether we accept it or not, Islam is a missiological religion, just as Christianity. Dawah is the equivalent in Islam of what we call mission in Christianity. And we have to contend. Now, this relationship has been particularly difficult in the areas where Christians are a minority and Muslims an overwhelming majority. In many such communities, Anglicans and other Christians have had their churches and schools destroyed by mobs with the tacit blessing of the local government. Many Anglican bishops in these situations have begun building bridges of mutual respect and mutual cooperation. For example, an attempt for finding middle ground with Muslims is in the area of health care. In areas where health care facilities are very rare, Anglican dioceses are establishing health centers with the express purpose of offering medical care and equal respect to both Muslim and Christian patients. The Diocese of Jerusalem is a shining light in this department. With a declining Christian population due to emigration, the diocese provides high quality education and medical care through well-funded network of schools and health facilities. Much of this work is possible by generous funding from members of the Episcopal Church through the American Friends of Jerusalem Diocese and the Compass Row Society. And despite the flood of Christians away from many war-torn areas of the Middle and Near East, Anglican Christians in these places continue to stay, not only to stay, but to engage, to witness, and to build. In Egypt, for instance, Anglicans are at the forefront, not only in ecumenical solidarity with Copts or Coptics and Orthodox and Roman Catholics, but they have taken the lead in dialogue and constructive work with Muslim religious leaders and scholars, building bridges and trust in the process. At the same time, and on more sensitive subject, Anglicans are also at the forefront of sharing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ with Muslims. Although exact figures are impossible to verify due to social pressures and death threats, many thousands of Muslims turn to Christ every year in places as far apart as Indonesia and Algeria, and many of these converts become Anglicans. In my own former diocese of Kaduna in Nigeria, three of my best priests and some Anglican bishops in nearby dioceses were former Muslims. Thirdly, let's talk about empowering women. The transforming power of the gospel is at work in the empowerment of women, and this is true among Anglicans especially. Women in the developing world have very difficult lives. It may not resonate with many of you, but I speak as an African that our women face very difficult lives. Poverty, diseases, famine, childhood illnesses, domestic violence, a life of carrying water, 
caring for too many children and working the fields. There are many challenges, many inequities, and many injustices. Much has been written about these issues, and appropriately so. The world should know and the world should care about our sisters. What is not written about or widely known is the role of Anglican Mothers' Union in all Africa and parts of the Caribbean. Mothers' Union is a powerful movement in almost every diocese on the continent of Africa. Begun in 1886 in England, and carried elsewhere by valiant Anglican women missionaries, the Mother's Union soon became a steady framework for church life around the world, especially in Africa. In almost every diocese today within the Anglican communion on the continent of Africa, the bishop's wife is the president of the Mother's Union, and she has clout and she gets things done. <laughs> what does she, or what do they do? I will just share a few with you. They build and run women's training centers to teach women marketable skills. They run schools to provide quality education to children in rural areas and provide significant female role models for girls to encourage them to avoid early marriage and to get a good education. And here is another story that is not well known. The United Thank Offering from the Episcopal Church Women in the United States has partnered with the Mothers' Union in many dioceses throughout the world to accomplish these goals, especially in East and Central Africa. Let me quickly move on to another area, growing respect for cultural differences. As we think of how evangelism has grown in the Anglican Communion, we should note as well how this very process has brought diverse peoples together in unexpected ways, for which, frankly, we have not always been prepared. As we all know, there have been many tensions within the Anglican Communion in recent years about differences, some theological, some cultural, some theological wrapped in cultural differences. We know that some of this has focused on differences over sexual morality. But just to keep everything in perspective, remember this. The Lambeth Conference discussed the issue of polygamy for about 100 years before reaching a definitive pastoral solution. You can check this up and see if I'm lying. Well, what is the outcome? That pastoral solution depended on an agreed upon theological framework regarding truth and purpose in human relationships. But the framework itself was left to be filled in locally as local churches and local bishops deal pastorally with the issue. That was a matter of tremendous work and the building of tremendous trust. Perhaps it is also a signal for how we must move ahead in other areas as well. In the current situation, we have some very serious difference of opinion about other issues. And the tensions are real. But we are still together, working through it as a family works through problems. One of the great and positive outcomes of the past 20 years is that Western Anglicans 
and Global South Anglicans are getting to know each other a lot better than before. Part of this growing awareness is the direct result of the controversies about sexual morality. On both sides of the issue, Anglicans from different parts of the world have made common cause with those who agree with their point of view. But something else has happened. When Western Christian Anglicans travel to the Global South, and when Global South Anglicans travel to the West, they begin to see the different contexts for ministry and faith and moral discernment. It isn't always easy, nor does it often result in agreement, and we don't always have to agree on everything, but it furthers the skills of listening and trust, from which many other benefits of common life derive. International mission trips and mission partnerships create friendship and mutual respect and most importantly, love. And when you come to love someone as your brother and sister in Christ, you begin to see the world differently. You carry your own opinions more lightly. You place a higher value on the gifts of fellow believers from a different culture. I have a friend who is a rector of a middle-sized parish here in the United States. He has only just recently retired. He took early retirement. His parish has been in partnership with a Nigerian diocese for the past 20 years. He has been on yearly mission trips there for the past 15 years. He tells me that his faith and his dedication to evangelism has been strengthened and his zeal for the gospel deepened by his interaction with the Nigerian Anglicans. At the same time, the Nigerian Anglicans, bishops, priests, and lay have come to appreciate the witness and generosity and dedication of the American Anglicans who give up their time and money and personal safety to engage in meaningful ministry partnership with their Nigerian brothers and sisters. Mutual respect and mutual appreciation for cultural differences go both directions. I cannot stress this enough. And I repeat, I cannot stress this enough. This kind of witness, uniquely offered by Christians and especially deep because of the challenges it is engaging among Anglicans, provides our divided world a tremendously needed way forward. This is not simply in sentimental terms, but in quite practical and political terms. I want to share a bit about sharing of resources. Another benefit of the growing global awareness within the Anglican family is the growing and deepening level of partnership between the different provinces on a material and spiritual level. You probably all know that Trinity Church, Wall Street in New York is the richest parish church in the world with more than $2 billion in assets. Fortunately, for the Anglican family, the parish uses its wealth to fund and facilitate mission partnership with Anglican dioceses all over the world. And while that is a very good thing, it is also a very good thing that many dioceses and parishes, even small parishes with limited resources, are entering into these kinds of partnerships. Churches and dioceses and individuals from the wealthy parts of the world are sharing gifts they have. And in return, parishes and dioceses 
and individuals from the developing world are sharing their own gifts, chief of which is a radical dependence on the providence and mercy of God. Anglicans from wealthy world always return home from such mission experiences with a deeper dependence on God and a deeper prayer life. Mutual gifts exchanged. Let me finally talk about missionary societies. One could even say that the entire Anglican communion is a missionary body in the deepest sense. We are familiar with the great missionary societies of Anglicanism, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel that eventually became USPG, the Church Mission Society, CMS, and more recently, the South American Missionary Society, SAMS. Their work is both legendary in its extent and self-giving, but also still very much alive in various parts of the world. But taken as a whole, our communion today, in all the ways I have just described and more, embodies the energies of the Holy Spirit, bringing the saving love of God in Christ to the world, day in, day out. In the face of all kinds of obstacles, many lodged within the church itself. And in light of this very real and vibrant mission, the understandable fears and worries about the communion, even the deeper temptations to despair, must dissipate. Paul tells us that in all our labors on the church's behalf, it is God who gives the growth, 1 Corinthians 3. God, my friends, brothers and sisters, is giving tremendous growth to all the planters and waterers. We are asked now to discern it, to give thanks for it, and to our own selves over to its service. Contrary to popular opinion, missionary societies are not a thing of the past, but remain, as they have been for centuries, a vital force within Anglican family of churches. And in my paper, which I hope you'll get, I've given a few examples of how these missionary organizations are still functioning today. In summary, World Anglicanism continues to be a vital force for the work of the kingdom of God throughout the world. St. Paul's words are as relevant today as 2,000 years ago. And if I may quote from Colossians chapter 1, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the world of the truth, the gospel which has come to you as indeed in the whole world. It is bearing fruit and growing. Brothers and sisters, as you prepare for a life of ministry here at VTS or whatever seminary you've come from, please know that it is a great adventure and high privilege to serve our Lord in his church. No chapter in the church's history has been without problems and challenges. And no chapter has been without blessings and joys and triumphs. You are part of the next generation whom God will use to bring the goodness of Jesus, love, to a world that desperately needs to know it. I thank you, and may God bless all you do. Thank you.
Uh, so I'd like to uh, add my voice to the welcome of the deem deans. It's our great pleasure and joy and privilege to have the Secretary General with us uh, for this uh, week. It's also my joy to welcome our panelists. And um, Dr. Ellen F. Davis is a groundbreaking and world-class scholar. She is the Amos Reagan Kearns Professor of Bible and Practical Theology at Duke University Divinity School. A leading lay Episcopalian, she is the author of 10 books and many articles. She was educated at the Church Divinity School of the Pacific, Oxford University, the University of California, Berkeley, and Hebrew University, Jerusalem. She earned her PhD at Yale University with distinction in 1987. Beyond Duke, she has teaching experience at Cambridge University, Yale Divinity School, Union Theological Seminary, and was from 1999 to 2001 Professor of Old Testament uh, and Language at Virginia Theological Seminary. She has been honored by a number of awards and doctorates, including in 2013, the Doctor of Humane Letters from Virginia Seminary. Her research interests focus on how biblical interpretation intersects with urgent public issues. She is an active theological consultant within the Anglican Communion and has worked since 2004 on theological education in the Episcopal Church of Sudan and South Sudan. The Reverend Robin Denny is a 2017 graduate of Virginia Seminary. She studied, uh, well, she basically studied wine, didn't you, Robin? <laughs> she studied viticulture and enology at UC Davis. Uh, she's a former Episcopal missioner with teaching experience at Cuttington University, Liberia. She also worked as the agricultural consultant for the province of Sudan and South Sudan. Currently, she is associate for Christian formation at St. Cross Episcopal Church, Hermosa Beach, California. At VTS, Robin was winner of the Dudley Speech Prize. She was also the winner of the Charles and Janet Harris Award, which is given to a student who has demonstrated academic excellence and leadership. But most importantly, in 2017, she was winner of the Anglican Communion Prize. <laughs> that prize recognizes a graduating student with an outstanding commitment to discerning the mission of God through world Anglicanism. The Reverend Canon John Harmon uh, was educated at St. Paul's College, Union Presbyterian Seminary, Lancaster Theological Seminary, Georgetown University, and Virginia Theological Seminary. He's currently completing a doctorate here at Virginia Seminary. Along with service to the church in a number of parishes, Canon Harmon also served as Episcopal chaplain at Norfolk State and Virginia State Universities. For 10 years, he served as a faculty member with the Credo Institute. With a deep commitment to the church and its call to transform society, he was a co-founder of the Episcopal Service Corps. Canon Harmon is also the founding rector of Trinity Education Arts Music Ministry, which serves young people through instruction in academics and in the arts. He is president of the Trinity Development Corporation, a multi-million dollar funded organization leading in HIV AIDS prevention, education, counseling, and health access to the underserved in Washington, DC. He is the 14th rector of Trinity Parish, Washington, DC, and an honorary canon of St. Albans Cathedral, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, East Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel. So the format this evening is quite simple. Questions will be asked and then they'll be answered. Uh, some of these questions emerge from uh, Secretary General's address and some of them have been submitted by the audience ahead of time. Uh, when I call your name, please raise your hand so that a microphone may be uh, delivered to you. I only ask 
that uh, if you're called upon to stick to the question that you emailed us ahead of time. <laughs> so let's begin with uh, our panelists and uh, what we heard uh, the Secretary General uh, say this evening. Two, three sentences on what we heard this evening. Ellen. I'll highlight three points. That the Anglican Communion is altogether a missionary body. Uh, and I think VTS's own history shows that. It really, especially with missionaries coming now from the African continent to North America. Second, that an inclusive church must include the rural poor. And I would add only that that is important also in North America, as it is in other parts of the world. Um, and third, that we must find a middle ground, build bridges uh, with Muslims. And I'd highlight that it's not only the wealthy churches, but also the poor churches, uh, including the church, Episcopal Church of Sudan and South Sudan that find that common ground through um, health care programs and schools. Thank you. John. I first must thank the Archbishop for clarifying membership in Anglican Communion in his recent uh, response. But what I heard tonight was that at the heart of Anglicanism, uh, is worship, evangelism, and outreach. That the communion is a missionary church, and that its worship leads to Christian hospitality, which is evangelism that results in outreach to the poor and the less fortunate. And that the long-standing uh, history of the communion uh, exhibit a kind of legacy that actually leads to the caring of souls and worship, enlightening minds through schools and education, and healing bodies and souls uh, through healthcare. Robin. I heard the Archbishop say that the Anglican Communion is alive and well, and he gave really concrete examples of that through the, the work that's going on around the Communion, both, both the physical ministry that's going on, uh, but also the, the Word of God being spread and lives being changed, and the way in which partnership especially um, is, is creating a, a deepening relationship that's both spiritual and material, uh, and that that has even been born out of our difficulties and our um, disagreements, that that deepening respect has been born out of faithful conversation, um, and that ministry itself is an adventure and a privilege. So given your summary, Robin, is there a question that emerges for the Secretary General? Yes. <laughs> so um, given, given this picture of the vitality of mission and, and an especially cross-cultural difference being valued and that respect being built, um, we know also from, from the history of, of mission that paternalism and colonialism have, have played a negative role. Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested to hear where in the communion today do you see um, that because, of course, paternalism is, is still alive, um, unfortunately. But where do you see it being really addressed head-on and combated or, or um, changed into this more life-giving relationship that you talked about? Um, this is a very... The example I have uh, could be problematic. <laughs> Um, I would want to avoid that. But simply, I would say, um, we are trying to discourage the, uh, the practice of just sending money, uh, and we now call for accountability. Let me give you an example. Uh, we have a small... Uh, fund at the Anglican Communion Office uh, for priests, bishops who have emergency health problems. And we receive a lot of uh, um, requests from, I want to be specific, Uganda and Sudan in particular. Uh, we have always insisted on getting uh, 
papers from certified hospitals and registered doctors to actually tell us this illness is real. In the, in the past, you just send money and often the money disappears. So we're trying to call for accountability and to let those who actually write to ask for help know that this money is given by people who are not that affluent, but it is their commitment to Christ that makes them to give sacrificially. So these are some of the things we're trying to do. But the more difficult example is um, where the crisis we face in the communion today, whether we accept it or not, a lot of money changes hands. And we're trying to discourage that. Yeah. John, a question that uh, arose for you as you listened. I would like to have Archbishop uh, address what can churches in North America and Europe learn from churches in the global south as to how the communion, uh, the vitality of the community can be sustained, especially since uh, church membership and attendance are declining uh, in those areas. Good question. This friend had mentioned that my paper. Um, it's alive. <laughs> it's, it is a real story. And I, I, I want to confess that it, it, the relationship is between his parish and the diocese I was looking after. Um, this brother will come for the two-week outreach and he will participate with us. He will sleep in huts with me. We will sleep in church buildings. He will eat whatever food is provided and you'll see him moving from one person to another, person to person evangelism, mass evangelism. And he's taken that to his parish. Actually, it's from the Diocese of Connecticut. Now, his parish, within a period of 10 years, has grown three times the size. They now have three services every Sunday. What is the secret? Preach the word challenge people and call for commitment. That's the secret. It's not telling people what they want to hear. And I want to say again, because in my going around, I've had the privilege. This is a very privileged job, actually, being Secretary General. You, you get to know different cultures. I have seen in this country, within the Episcopal Church, churches or parishes that are growing. Secret, preaching the word and just reaching out with the love of Jesus Christ. So that's what is happening. I came back from Chile last week. Chile is now uh, the next diocese to become a province in the Anglican Communion. You have, when you meet Christians, they talk to you about what Jesus Christ means to them. Who is Jesus and what has he done in your life? Practical examples. And tech is doing that. The only thing is uh, people see what they want to see. <laughs> I'm not saying this because uh, I already have my return ticket anyway. <laughs> so, uh, Tech is doing that, but there is a lot of spinning going on. But the antidote to spinning is for you to grow and tell stories of what is happening. Yeah. Thank you. Alan, a question that emerged for you. Your Grace, would you speak to us about your vision for theological education, both in the global south and in the west? What would you see as the growth points for promoting vitality throughout the communion? Thank you. For the global south, I, I do agree that there is 
growth in terms of numbers, population. But it is unfortunate that there isn't uh, the second part of the command Jesus has given to us. He, say, he, he said to us, go and teach and baptize. There isn't enough teaching going on in majority of, I have to be careful now because I've been accused by some of my good friends from the global south of saying uh, Africa, uh, some parts of Africa, there isn't uh, enough teaching going on, discipling people. For example, you come across a young person, uh, she would tell you, oh, I became a Christian 12th of December, uh, 2006, and then you ask, so what? What has happened? What's your knowledge of the Bible? What do you know about Anglicanism? What do you know about the Trinity? What do you know about the various doctrines in the church? Nothing. So there is a need for uh, a good number of uh, uh, the parts of the global south, especially in Africa, to have real uh, uh, progressive uh, syllabus to build the Christians up. You pick four or five, uh, talk about my own country. I can, I can critique my own country. You pick Christians and Muslims, look at the way they behave. There is no difference. Corruption, telling lies, cheating, there is no difference. And it is because, yes, I'm a Christian. So what? What has Christ, your, your faith in Christ, how has that changed you? How has it transformed you? And how is that seen by those who are non-believers? Now, in the West, I think the problem we have, and I'm saying we because I now live in the West, um, is that we are often uh, too coy about our faith. We are trying to privatize salvation. And you know, with that mentality, the Episcopal Church, my church, cannot really grow. We have to be, uh, to be bold. This is who I am. <laughs> I cannot help being who I am as a result of my coming to Jesus Christ. He has transformed me, and this is the way I live. I do not, I don't have to please you. I think that's the problem we have in the world. You got it. Theologically, we come here, we still come here to study. You have it. All your libraries, all the faculties, all the professors, you have it. But for God's sake, live it out. Um, you all know you have um, slogans. Every state has a slogan. Am I correct? Am my best state? Thank you. That's it. <laughs> you read in my mind. Show me state. I love that state. And that's what I want to say to my brothers and sisters of the uh, Episcopal Church, because this is my family. We are a family. Show the world that something has happened. And this country was actually founded on the basis of the Bible. When Muslims come in, when Buddhists come in, let them know we have our own religion. Because even in Islam, the, the Quran tells you, you have your religion, I have my religion. Lakum denukum waliyadin. Let's, let's live it. You don't have to be... Uh, to be offensive, you don't have to push it, you know, or, or, or drum it down the throat of the people, but just leave it. Let them see the difference, and then tech will change. Thank you. So we had a range of questions from audience members over a range of subjects. Jim Sanders has a question. Uh, I wonder, is he here, and if he can raise his hand. Jim. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for um, your insightful and inspirational lecture. I was wondering if you could um, tell us what, in your opinion, 
are the factors that help to account for Boko Haram's resilience. The military has retaken some territory, but the group has not gone away. Thank you very much, good question, and that is very close to my heart. You know, Boko Haram um, actually started, you have a lot of theories, and I also have my own theory, <laughs> based on what I discovered. I, I did uh, a certificate in conflict prevention, and I used Boko Haram as my case study. Whether Nigerian politicians accept this fact or not, this is true. Boko Haram was given rise to as a result of bad governance, corruption, politicians not using the resources given to them for the interest and the well-being of their people. So it started as a movement that resisted the normal way of governing, number one. Number two, ignorance again. Um, I come from the northern part of Nigeria. We have Muslims, but in the southwestern part of Nigeria, we also have a huge number of Muslims. In fact, I think four of the five governors in the southwest are Muslims. They govern their people. They are accountable to their people. But in my own part of the, of the country, our governors, our politicians are not accountable to us. The traditional rulers tell us who to vote for. So Boko Haram was meant to resist, and it was a, a protest movement. However, it also had um, uh, this religious, the, the, the extremist uh, uh, part of Islam, they felt, well, to do this, we need integrity. And if we go in the name of Islam, because this is an Islamic area, people will follow us, people will believe in us. For those of you who do not know, and Professor John Campbell will correct me here, 86% of the population in the Northeast is Islamic, is Muslim. So there was no need, it was not a jihad. <laughs> there was no need, they're not Christians there. So it was meant to sanitize and to get the politicians to actually do politics according to the principles of the Quran. Unfortunately, it festered. It was badly handled by the police, by the army, and it became uh, a full-blown war. Unfortunately, the Christian leadership nationally did not believe the Muslim leadership nationally that said, look, these guys are not representing us. This is not our type of Islam. Unfortunately, the Christian leadership nationally said, well, we don't believe you. And that made it to get worse. So it's, it's political uh, with a religious facade. I think that's the way I want to put it. Thank you. Alan, I'd like to turn uh, to you particularly as a scholar of um, sacred texts and kind of um, widen the um, conversation a little bit around this question of um, religiously, alleged religiously inspired um, um, violence, for example, we can point to Christian um, inspiration as well, like the Lord's Resistance Army. Um, observers, scholars talk about anointings before battles, leaders apparently depending on the spirit to choose good soldiers. Historically, we can point to the Afrikaner interpretations of the Exodus and um, the conquest as a way to di dispossess other race races. Uh, and even in this country and at this time, uh, there is a radicalism that draws from biblical images and texts. The uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, for example, tracking hate groups, uh, some of which trade on Christian theological uh, and biblical imagery and text. So the question is, as a scholar of sacred texts, what pers 
perspective do you bring to so-called religious violence, both within and beyond Christianity? This question shapes my teaching now because for about the last 10 years, most of my seminar teaching has been done in partnership with a religiously committed Jew or Muslim. Uh, and I do that because I think that my students need to be equipped to have respectful conversations with peoples of other faith. What I think all of us are concerned about and can see more clearly now than we could a decade ago is that in each of our traditions, religious extremism has brought to an acute stage the question of religious identity. What does it mean to me to be a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew? And it seems to me that there's a key connection between terrorism on the one hand, um, religious identity, and genuine interfaith conversation. So those three things. I've come to think that genuine theological conversation amongst people of different faiths and finding common ground in mission, for instance, these are the only long-term alternatives to terrorism. And that terrorism appears to be an answer, purports to be an answer to the question of religious identity, but it's an idolatrous answer because it does not recognize, as all of our traditions do, that God is Lord of all human beings. And so the only way to counter that in the long run is by claiming my religious identity in the presence of the religiously other and becoming more confident of my sense of identity, not by destroying their body or by destroying the symbol of their faith, but by learning to articulate difference in respectful ways, as the Archbishop said. Mm, thank you. Uh, Richard Jones has uh, a question. The Anglican Communion, of course, exists within this wider world of violence and uh, repression. And Dr. Jones has a specific question about the Church of Sudan and South Sudan. Archbishop, I thank God that the Secretary General of the Anglican Communion is a missionary. Could you tell us what difference recognizing Sudan as the 39th province of the Anglican Communion could make to its inner life and strength and to its outward uh, survival and witness. And were there time, I'd ask about the American relation to that church, but only one question at a time. Thank you. Um, because of the uh, separation of uh, South Sudan from Sudan, we felt for Sudan, for the Christians in Sudan to uh, get this sense of belonging, this sense to, to, to have an identity it will be good for them to be recognized as Christians in the Islamic State of Sudan. We therefore met with some of the uh, government officials and they, they endorsed it uh, and said, well, you know, the, the, the enemy of my friend is my enemy type of thing. Uh, they felt it would be easier to work with the Christians in the Sudan and not to have Sudan attached to South Sudan. So to answer your question, firstly, 
the uh, creation of Sudan province, the 39th province, has given the people of Sudan themselves a sense of identity. They now know that they are not attached to South Sudan. And like I said during the um, uh, inauguration of the province with the Muslim leaders there, I said to them, you now touch anybody in this church in Sudan, you've touched over 85 million people in the world. And of course, I bluffed. I said, including yours truly and the United Kingdom. And they all laughed. Uh, so uh, that's number one. Number two, we also believe that Sudan becoming a province will help that church to begin to find ways and means of relating to their Muslim neighbor in order not only to survive, but to grow. You see, the method in South Sudan cannot be used in Sudan. It will not work. Because Christians in Sudan are a minority. And the method you use when you are a majority cannot work where you are in a minority. So we're actually working with the, uh, the leadership in Sudan to share our own experiences from northern Nigeria, which is exactly like Sudan, with uh, Sudan people. And the third thing is, uh, for wealthier provinces, like your province, to know that you now have a part of your body that is poor. And I mean poor. Poverty is a big problem in Sudan. We've only just succeeded in getting an organization to even pledge to pay the salaries and allowances of the priests and the bishops for one year. If I tell you that in Sudan, when I went for the first inspection, I asked the internal archbishop, how, do you, how much do you pay the bishops? I won't tell you because you won't believe it. And I said, if you pay the bishop <laughs> $50 a month, how much does the bishop pay the priest? He said, well, whatever comes in. And yet, it's a province. So it is to, uh, to alert all of us to what is happening there. But the good news is they now have an identity. And the working relationship with the government so far has been very cordial. And we hope we will maintain it and Sudan will be able to grow. And we, we have almost a million Christians there. Almost a million Christians. Aaron, Aaron Pellet has a question that reminds us that while there is much affection at work in the communion, there is also disaffection. And I think I'm going to ask a couple of members of the panel to respond to this first. Aaron. Um, uh, kind of just looking at the current state of Anglicans, I think the Secretary General spoke to this earlier about tension um, that exists. Um, amongst Anglicans that has divided us and separated us um, in ways formally and informally, how is the Holy Spirit uh, working to reconcile us to God and to one another? John. Thank you. I think that a deep sense of listening to God is important in terms of working through tension and disagreement because to ground ourselves in our own position actually isolates us from listening to what God might be saying to us and to the ground of freedom to which we'll be called, especially in the relationships we are called to engage. So I, th I think listening, prayerful listening is important, but also respecting the, the dignity and the position uh, and the faith of those that we're called to walk with. I, I believe that unity is very much at the heart of uh, resolving conflict and tension. Robin, I'm going to ask you the same question drawing from your experience. Um, I think that 
this, the sense of, of uni family unity that the Archbishop mentioned, that, that sometimes family disagreements are, are deeper and more painful, and um, that we have a lot of energy to reach out beyond, even in, in interfaith dialogue, you know, re reach out across more difficult boundaries, um, but that reaching across um, just, just within the communion, sometimes even, you know, within our own towns um, to, to each other can, can be very, very difficult when we're in the same family. Um, but I think that there are some examples that can really inspire us, and the Archbishop has given us a number of examples. And in, um, in my time in, in South Sudan, I saw uh, clergy literally risking their lives um, to preach a message of peace, but uh, peace is just, is just a word unless you, unless you hang on it, what, what that actually means, and that means learning to take Jesus's message to love your enemy seriously. And for them that meant learning to forgive the person that had killed my family during the war or something like that, something so grave and difficult um, that, that's impossible for human beings to do. And yet, if the power of Christ working in them can not only empower them to preach that message to somebody that's holding a gun, but also to live it in their own lives, then surely the power of Christ can work in us um, to, to unite us across lesser differences than that. Um, and I, I think when I, when I begin to despair of, um, of our, our internal arguments, I, I think about, about those things. We are, you may. This question of uh, agreement and disagreement. We had an experience in Nigeria when we were becoming uh, independent. Uh, the, the North, we have the population and we will always win election, whether it is rigged or it's not rigged. <laughs> um, the Southeast, which is the Igbo section, they don't have the population. So their leader then, Christian, met with our leader, Muslim, to say, look, let's work together. And our leader, Sadona by name, said, well, tell me about your, your people. And he did. He now asked, um, the Christian leader asked our own leader, tell me about the North. He did about our different cultures, our main religion, Islam, and some Christians and traditional worshipers. And the Christian said, and I want you to listen to this, it will help us. I work with it. He said, well, Sedona, we have, we're different. Let's forget about our differences and work on. And our leader from the north, a Muslim, said, no. Let us understand our differences. And I think for me, that is very, very important. We must learn to understand our differences. We can live with differences if there is that understanding. And as Robin has said, we must never forget that we are Christians. Thank you. A reception awaits. I'm talking right now of a terrestrial reception outside. Um, nothing grander than that. But we do have time for one more question. Uh, Jean uh, Cotting has a question about personal faith and formation. Yes, um, uh, thank you, Secretary General. I had the um, privilege of hearing you speak last night about um, your journey from being a student in a military academy um, and deciding to uh, be a soldier for Christ. Um, could you share a little bit about that experience and what it is like looking back um, from, the, from the position that you are in now of uh, what that was like, that transition? Mm. In about one minute, I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think with a hindsight, I want to uh, thank God for helping me to stand by the conviction uh, I believed and I still believe he gave me uh, because all my classmates where they retired as generals in the army, 
but they are all retired, and I'm the only general still serving. <laughs> uh, number, number two, um, I, I, I have fulfillment in what I'm doing. Like I shared yesterday, uh, I was going to retire in 2015 and face a little center in Kaduna where we run education programs for Christian leaders on Islam. I teach Islam. And in my class, I have Muslim scholars. They sit there to testify to the fact that I am not dissimulating. I like doing that. Now, and I felt, well, if I have done this between Christians and Mus Muslims with our major doctrinal difference, especially vis-a-vis -vis the person of Jesus Christ, I, the Lord said to me, what about your own family? The Anglican communion. You have a lot of disagreement. Have you thought about that? That was why I applied for this job. So I believe, uh, even though I'm just beginning, I'm in the right place. It's tough, but I have hope. Thank you. So, You're going to have to do that all over again in a minute. Because I do want to um, just close by asking our panelists a, a similar um, question uh, that sums up for you uh, God's calling upon your life as um, an Episcopalian, as a, a, an Anglican. Ellen. It echoes, in a sense, what the Archbishop has just said. It's tough, but I have hope. Um, Romans 15, 4, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. I think in this country, we tend to think of hope as a mood, a feeling that might pass, but I think what Paul is suggesting is that hope is a commitment, um, and it, it takes work, it takes study, it takes listening to scripture. Robin. So I, I was only recently um, ordained as a priest, and um, my, I think my core identity is still, and, and will always be as a missionary, um, in the sense that the Archbishop spoke about, in terms of the way in which uh, cross-cultural relationship uh, especially within this vital Anglican communion in which we, we participate, has, um, has so shaped me and, and changed me and helped me to see God ar around me in the world, um, but also acting in my own life. Um, and that, that the more that I engage in cross-cultural relationship, the more I'm blessed by it, by being able to see myself differently um, and to be, be deepened by, by, by deep friendships with people with whom I outwardly disagree, um, or come from, come from a different place. And, and to me, that's um, the heart of, of the Christian connection of, of mission, is this love across a, a perceived uh, boundary of, of difference. John. There's no saying that God has no grandchildren, hmm. that each of us have to actually live into what we believe about God and then act on that faith. I believe that somehow evangelism is at the heart. It's truly hospitality. And that uh, when Jesus speaks in Matthew's gospel that when I was in prison, you visited me. You know, when I was hungry, you fed me. Uh, when I was without clothes, you gave me something to wear, you gave me something to drink. I think that kind of action uh, that is granted in our faith is true evangelism. And I believe that's where we who are children of God can begin to form the next generation so God there's no grandchildren, but those children of ours become God's children as well. Thank you. Uh, just before we close and I um, give final thanks, um, please don't rush away. Uh, we do have some refreshments and ushers uh, will direct you. 
Uh, I really do want to thank you all for attending, for those that have been uh, listening to us uh, on the live stream. We hope that you enjoyed the conversation uh, virtually as uh, well as we have here uh, in the room. Anglicanism is alive and well, I heard the Secretary General say. It is made up of a myriad of contextualizations and contestations and confessions. We owe a debt of gratitude to our keynote speaker this evening, the Most Reverend Dr. Jesai Idu-Ufir and Secretary General of the Anglican Communion. And we owe a debt for the thoughtful, insightful uh, contribution of Professor Ellen Davis, of the Reverend Robin Denny, and of the Reverend Canon John Harmon. Thank you, everyone. Please thank our panelists. <laughs>